everyone, and uh, welcome to the uh, to the first session of uh, of Popple this uh, this year in 2008. Okay, everyone, welcome to the first session of Popple, where we combine two of our favorite things: types and effects. And uh, the first talk today is going to be a talk on adding linear types to Haskell by Arnaud Spiwak. And uh, welcome. Thank you, and uh, thank you everybody for being here. I'm uh, Arno from 3GIO, and uh, I can hardly believe I'm here. At least two, two years ago, me can hardly be believe he's here. And let, let me explain. Um, so this all started, uh, we were working uh, on a distributed storage project. And, and uh, probably because we're biased, uh, the idea of linear types came up from time to time until it became a, a joke. Every other week, it was like, you know what would be helpful for that? Linear types. Um, so after joking about that for, I don't know, six months, um, we decided we could actually take the joke seriously. Um, but, um, so, the, the idea of using linear types to solve programming problems uh, is not new, like, at all. Uh, and since uh, the 80s, when linear logic was introduced, it has been immediately picked up by computer scientists. And um, you can see the 1990 paper uh, uh, from Phil Wadler. Uh, I don't know if you can read the date, but it is, it is early enough. It was before Haskell. Uh, and that, would be, that had been su um, suggested as a way uh, to deal with effects before we discovered the idea of Monad. So it's, it's really not something new. But on the other hand, uh, nobody does it. So, so, so why is it? Uh, the, the reason is that there, is, um, there doesn't seem to be a very good way to, um, to introduce linear types in a way that doesn't mess up the rest of the language. It, it changes things. And Rust is a good example of that. It's a wonderful language that embraces linear and substructural logics um, at height. But then it is designed around this. And... Um, and, and so you get something like this. Uh, I mean, this is not Rust. Uh, this is like a pidgin Haskell uh, written using uh, an interesting linear logic language. And everything seems to be, uh, needs to be annotated and deboxed whenever you're using something. It, it, there has been other, other ways to do that. Uh, but so far, they only uh, created uh, very, fairly complex systems. And they're completely fine. Uh, they're really nice systems that work uh, quite well, and you can program normally in them and linearly in them. The problem is that uh, when interacting with a full-blown programming language, uh, like Haskell in our case, or OCaml, or something else, then all these uh, complex features, it's not clear where they fit. And um, so that's why uh, one, two years ago, if someone told me, oh, you're going to go to a conference in two years, and you're going to talk about adding linear types to Haskell, I would say, no way, it happens in like 20 years. But it, it, it turns out uh, Jean-Philippe Bernardi, who was uh, one of the pictures at the beginning, uh, came up with uh, fairly strong ideas, and he convinced me this could be done, and we started uh, doing this. And what we came up with is something like that. It's, it's, it's about as simple as what I wrote on this slide. Of course, uh, you can see that there's more than 10 extra slides, uh, so um, I'm lying slightly. Uh, but generally speaking, we add one type to Haskell, and it's mostly orthogonal to all, all the other features, so it's fairly easy to, to formalize, it's fairly easy to implement. And that's the goal. Um, so what does this type, this type mean? Um, I have to be clear on, on the fact that if you, if you look at substructural system or linear systems in the wild, they mean vastly different things uh, by a linear function. So I, I want to be very, very clear on what is the meaning that I intend. And uh, as I wrote there, I say a linear function from A to B um, is a function that if its result is consumed exactly once, then its argument is also consumed exactly once. And that is the one promise we're making, and this is what we're typing. And what does consume exactly once mean? Well, it, if, if you see your data as, as a tree, it basically means walking through every node once. 
So uh, for instance, at the pair, uh, you would pass and match on the pair and consume exactly once both of the components as part of your evaluation of your program. Um, and, and, and to walk you through the implications of this, I, I will, uh, I will uh, walk through one example uh, for the rest of this talk. Uh, and this is mutable arrays. So this is how we do mutable arrays uh, in, uh, in Haskell. Actually, this is how we do immutable arrays in Haskell, but we use mutable arrays to implement them. So let's look at this. Um, we take a list, an association list, that represents uh, the, the array, but as a data type. And then we allocate a new array, it's mutable, and uh, we go through the list and write all the cells the way they should be, and then we freeze the array. And that's where the real uh, trick is. Uh, so we, we, didn't, we don't change the array, we just return this array with the promise that we will never ever mutate it again. And of course this isn't safe because the, 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 the language cannot check that. I could have snuck in, snuck out, sorry, a, a mutable array and then mut mutate it. And, and then suddenly uh, I have this uh, array that promises to be immutable and that breaks referential transparency and, and that is bad and that breaks Haskell and you might get sequels and things like that. Really bad. So, uh, of course, it's a bit of a toy example, but what I want to walk you through is how, what, how can we use linear types to make freeze safe? So it looks a bit like this. Uh, it's, 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 the, the structure of the code is a bit different. Uh, we have a fold instead of a forum, but that's pretty much the same thing. So the same components are there. We allocate an array. Uh, we go through the list, uh, writing uh, new values in the array, and then freeze. Now, it's, it's safe, because basically, uh, I have arranged uh, my API so that the mutable array cannot be referred to after freeze at all. It, it would be a type error. So how do we do this? Uh, let me take you through the, the moving bits. Um, so let's start with read, which I don't actually use, but it's, it's a good example. Um, so let's look at this type very closely. Uh, it takes an array, it returns an array. Why is that? Uh, because we will arrange that every function uh, that use arrays will uh, make this array disappear so that no one can use them. And, but, but read, it says, okay, I can mutate an array. Uh, I, after, after I read it, I can still mutate this array. So I will return it as well. But it's the same array. And, uh, and we, we return an A. Uh, that's the value we read, the element of the array that we looked at. And uh, this is almost, because uh, uh, what I said is, uh, if I consume the pair exactly once, then I consume the array exactly once. Consuming the array exactly once is my goal. This is what I must do. So I must consume the, the pair exactly once, which means, as I said earlier, uh, consuming both components exactly once. And the second component is the element I want to read, and I, I don't really care about, it, about reading it exactly once. So it's not exactly what I want. That would be really painful to use. Um, so let me introduce a new data type. Uh, I read it unrestricted, and I write it u, uh, because I'm lazy and because uh, slight spaces is precious. Um, so it's just an ordinary data type, but it's, it's in its type that it's storing something uh, that is nonlinear. So when you pattern match on it, what you get out, uh, the end in the orange square, uh, is unrestricted, and you can use it as many times as you want. And that, is, that, that doesn't violate um, the linearity constraint. So that's much better. Uh, we have a bit more uh, of a syntactic overhead, but apart from that, um, this is exactly what we want as a semantics. Um, so that, that's it for read, but let's look at the difficult bit. That's the new array. So how do we do this? Um, okay, so we could try doing something like this, but this is really, 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 really not what we want. Uh, because this is a linear function, and it says, if, if I consume the array exactly once, then I consume the integer exa exa exactly once. And there is nothing right about this. Uh, it means that I can use the array as many times as I want, just if I use it, exactly once, if I consume it exactly once, then it means something for the integer. And I don't care about the integer. I can use it as many times as I want. That's really not my semantics. And um, the problem is here is that linearity is a property of functions, so we have 
uh, to take a function and say, to, to define a consumer and, and say that uh, the array is consumed uh, by this function. Uh, so basically, we say that we want that the continuation uh, consume the array exactly once. We reify this continuation as a function. Uh, so that's basic CPS. And that doesn't work. Uh, that doesn't work because uh, I can just pass the identity in and let the array escape the scope. Um, so the, um, the, the continuation is not airtight, and it doesn't guarantee that it will consume the array exactly once. So we need another trick. Actually, the same trick. Um, it's unrestricted. Uh, the U type. Uh, so instead of returning a B, of an arbitrary B, we return an unrestricted B. Uh, and so we can think of that as, since it's unrestricted, it cannot contain an array. Since arrays have to be consumed exactly once, they cannot be passed to unrestricted. So we have to be a bit careful about that, especially in the context of Haskell, uh, because of lazy thunks, and uh, the lazy thunk kind could encapsulate uh, the array, but we can make that precise. And if we define, uh, actually we do define, and that, that works operationally, uh, unrestricted, uh, I mean consuming a value at type unrestricted of A to mean just pattern match on it, and exactly once. And, 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 and the, the, the value that we get back, we don't care. And, and so just to define the function new, new MRA, we pattern match on, on, the, uh, on the U of B, so that means, by definition of a linear function, we uh, consume the array exactly once. And, and that's it. Uh, everything falls into place. Uh, we cannot uh, use the array incorrectly, and freeze becomes safe. So, I don't know, victory doing something, something. Um, oops. Uh, so, yeah, that was the idea. Now, uh, let's look at fold. Because that was the uh, sort of the last piece. Uh, it has a weird type uh, to cope with linear types, and and that, that would be terrible. We don't want to define everything twice or maybe more. That, that it would be it would just it would not be reasonable. Uh, it, it it would just no one would work with that. So uh, our solution is uh, just polymorphism, like standard ML-like polymorphism. Except instead of doing it on types, we do that on linearity. Uh, so we have these small annotations on, on, on arrows, and the two arrows that we've uh, defined or used so far are just aliases for arrows uh, with indices at a particular uh, value. And uh, we call these values multiplicities, and they can be variables. And suddenly we can have a, a, a polymorphic fold L that instantiates to the normal type of fold L and the type that we needed. Uh, well, that's much better. Um, so uh, that's pretty much uh, what the system looks like. And uh, so let me take the, rem the remainder of my talk to discuss what we've actually done with this. Um, we're pretty serious about this. Uh, it's being implemented. Uh, but by the way, uh, all the things in this slide are clickable, and I'll put the slides online very soon, so you'll, you'll find them in the program. Um, so uh, it, is, uh, it is being implemented as a GHC extension, a, a bona fide GHC extension. It's not, it, it is not something that lives on its own, so it's, it's a good test that it's working. Uh, well, sort of, soon. Uh, be patient or be brave if you want to use it. You can use it today if you will, uh, but it, it, still, it, it still has bugs and uh, it's not, it doesn't implement the entire proposal. Uh, but it, it is being proposed for inclusion into mainline GHC. Um, and uh, we've designed uh, quite a few examples on it. Uh, the first one is in the paper. Uh, that's been written by, uh, by Ryan, Ryan Newton, uh, who's in the audience. And uh, he, the idea is to... Um, is to uh, walk through, a, to, to just never deserialize the data structure, or never serialize them, and work directly on their serialized form. Uh, it's a lot of fun, and it, uh, it prevents many allocations, which can be problematic in, um, in a distributed program. Um, the sort of things you just cannot do uh, in, a, in a regular type system. It's just so error prone that no one would do that. And my proof is that no one does that. Um, but 
on the other hand, with linear types, it, it has been a breeze. It's, it's, it's even fun to do. Um, so that's a good that's a good slogan for all of us. That just linear types are fun to use. Um, and so I'm I, I've been developing a, a, a small uh, libraries for use uh, with linear types to to, to just to help bootstrap the programs. Uh, it has um, so it, it has an implementation of the I/O monad where you can uh, ensure that you never use or free a file that has already been freed or other resources like that. Um, there's a prototype based uh, on sockets as well where you, uh, where, where you just cannot use. The, the sockets have a very um, uh, intricate protocol uh, depending on whether they are TCP sockets and UDP sockets and you have to do these things in order. Um, and, uh, and so this just guarantees that you use the right uh, steps. Um, I also implemented um, a, uh, a version of, uh, of data types that lives outside uh, the GC heap and that you manually malloc and free and that is entirely safe. Um, so that's, uh, that's something interesting. We had a, a summer of code uh, on the streaming library for Haskell, uh, which is a library that looks like it really needs linear types. Um, we've, got, we've had some success on that. that was, um, but uh, maybe uh, fine types are better for this. And uh, we have one external contribution. So uh, more victory dances. Uh, so uh, Samuel Genino has implemented a, a DSL to write 3D models for 3D printers. And um, these models, uh, they, are, they, they, they are guaranteed not to have uh, wild edges that live without fa faces attached to them or things like that, uh, which usually uh, in, in modelization languages are implemented as uh, runtime errors when you evaluate the, lang evaluate the, uh, the model. Uh, it says things like, uh, this model is not water typed. Um, and, and, and so by, uh, by using linear types, he was able to make sure that every model that you write could be printed and you never get this sort of runtime errors. Uh, that's super fun. Um, so um, just uh, to conclude, uh, nothing that I said is particularly um, specific to Haskell. Uh, there, there are some complications due to, lean, due, due, due to laziness in Haskell uh, that you might not have in a strict language like OCaml, uh, in which case you might be able to do a bit more. Um, though it's um, still, uh, it's fairly generic and if you want to add linear types to your language, you, can, you might consider giving it a spin. Um, something I haven't mentioned, uh, but that was written on the slides, is that we reuse the same, uh, the exact same data types uh, as Haskell, so the pairs, um, that's what plays the role of the tensor in linear logic is ordinary pairs and that is still compatible and lists are still lists. Um, that, that's very useful so that uh, there's, a, there's a smooth transition with that copying uh, between linear, linear programs and intuitionistic programs. Um, so um, that ends my presentation and I'll be taking your questions now. Thank you very much. Okay, so I have several questions. My first question is about uh, the type uh, you presented for the new array uh, function. Yeah. Uh, it seems to me that if you use this function as is, um, well, somehow you, you, you invert the control. So this means that you cannot uh, I mean, somehow allocate two arrays and deallocate this in an unnested fashion? Uh, so um, in that case, it's, it's uh, given to the GC, so they can be deallocated in any fashion. Uh, but no, the deallocation is not given to the scope. Uh, the scope just makes sure that you have deallocated. Uh, when you have like, uh, like the malloc thing that I mentioned, um, it just tells you you have to deallocate before you exit the scope. And so you can, com you can be completely non-stack-like. Uh, yeah, okay, for deallocation, but um, yeah. you, you, you have to somehow um, uh, leave the scope at the, in the same order you created the arrays. Uh, uh, yes, uh, and, and they tend to be, uh, to be stuck together at the end. Uh, so you have several scope and they all exit at the same time. It's, uh, it's both common. Uh, another question I have is I'm kind of surprised that um, 
you have you decided to introduce linearity by having to kind of arose instead of saying that only some types needs to be linear. So does that does that mean that you have um, an idea of um, of some example of types that sometimes are near linear and sometimes are not? Um, that that so is types that you sometimes want to put before uh, a magic one and sometimes want to put before a, a normal door. Uh, so the, the the goal is explicitly not to do that, and um, the short reason is uh, it, it's a trade-off between expressivity and simplicity. It's, it's, it, you, you get a much simpler type system, in my opinion, at least something that I know how to implement. Uh, where, whereas um, if you if you take uh, lin some, some linear types and you want to have some polymorphism, uh, so you want to have fold being able to handle uh, types uh, of sorts uh, of sort linear and of sort nonlinear, uh, you have to jump through many hoops. And uh, there's something that uh, that it, that I can do on its own. Uh, there are several languages that do that. Um, but I don't really know how to add that to Haskell and all the interaction that it would have with the rest of the system. Um, and uh, because um, I, so I, I didn't, what I didn't try is just implement both uh, solutions and see which one is actually best. So it's mostly a hunch. What I mean is, is yeah. yeah, we can we can I, we can take that offline, and I can answer for half an hour if you wish. Please tell us about error messages. So there was a notorious version of GHC that would delete your source code if it found a type error. I, I imagine you've probably found a slightly friendlier approach, but uh, how comprehensible are, are your messages when you make a mistake? Um, so uh, there is still work to do at this point. Uh, what they say is at, at the location of a binder uh, that uh, introduces a linear variable, for instance, and you have used it nonlinearly, it will tell you um, it will tell you you've used it nonlinearly, and that is bad. Uh, the problem is not always completely trivial to understand why this has been computed, because maybe you think you've used it linearly, but it's something else that has the wrong type annotation or something. And uh, what I want to add is just a trace of the calculation, so that we can see uh, why uh, the uh, why it has been computed as uh, as having has have been been used in a more liberal fashion than linear. Uh, so far, it's pretty okay, uh, but, but there's still, yeah, there's still improvement to be done. Okay, we have time for one more question. Uh, so, uh, so I, I wanted to ask a question about the unrestricted data type you have. Uh, it's a pretty cool trick, but it does seem to come at a downside that you have to have an indirection in order to uh, make something unrestricted. So what I was curious about is, is it possible to replace data with new type and unrestricted and achieve the same thing? No. Really? Uh, this would be incorrect, uh, because the strictness of the pattern matching is essential. And if you start using new type uh, for this, uh, it will uh, it, it, it will no, it will uh, the pattern matching will be uh, implemented as identity, which is non-strict, and uh, the, uh, the the linear things that are in your lazy funk will stay there and will be executed out of order and break. But it's just, uh, for instance, in the case of the uh, malloc thing, it will just sec fault. Uh, well, you get memory corruption thing, and it, it, no, it, it doesn't work. Um, but what you, what you could do uh, is if you could have a, a, a strict wrap, wrapper uh, of a different sort. Um, uh, so Haskell has these. Um, uh, strict tuples. Uh, you could use a strict uh, one tuple that happens to capture something like that uh, nonlinearly, and that would work. I, I think I haven't uh, done the math yet, um, and, and that doesn't cost anything. Interesting. Thank you. Uh, we have time for one last quick question. <laughs> I'd like to have a quick answer. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah I just wanted to uh, hear if you can tell us something about the multiplicities. Is that you showed one and in infinity, but is there zero, one, two, three? Uh, in, in, the, in the current uh, uh, in the current uh, uh, formalism, there are just two, one and omega. Mm -hmm. In the implementation, there are uh, there is a zero as well, which is super useful for inference. Uh, and uh, but that could be much more. Um, the uh, the relevant literature for that is the uh, coeffect literature, yeah. and uh, basically what you need is a uh, lattice-ordered, uh, well, joint semi lattice-ordered uh, semi-ring. It's, it's uh, and pretty much any one of them will, will do. Okay. Sir, let's all 